Welcome to unit number 14 of our series, Finding God Through Faith and Reason. This is our final segment, and uh, we've come a long ways in this series. We've come through, well, three philosophical proofs for God's existence. St. Thomas Aquinas' proof of an uncaused cause, which turned out to be pure acting power, turned out to be absolute simplicity. We saw, of course, that there had to be an unconditioned reality, and that unconditioned reality had to be absolutely simple, that the absolutely simple had to be one and unrestricted, and the one unrestricted, absolutely simple, uh, unconditioned reality had to be the continuous creator of all else that is. We also saw, too, that that, um, uh, through the Hilbertian prohibition of infinities to algorithmically finite structures, we saw that past time had to be finite. And that that eventually would lead to a creator which could not be in time or conditioned by time. And that if it wasn't conditioned by time, then unchangeable. And if unchangeable, then not in potency to anything, but had to be in pure act. Just as St. Thomas Aquinas had said, just as that notion of absolute simplicity suggests, because, of course, anything which is in pure act, anything which is in pure potency to anything, uh, which is not in potency to anything, cannot have a boundary, cannot have any restriction. Because if it did, it would automatically uh, be restricted. So it could become, it is possible to, to, to become something else being that that is the case being that we have this absolutely simple reality we said of the absolutely simple not only that it was truth itself and love itself and goodness itself and beauty itself but we also said that it was one and that it had to be one and of course we're trying to look at this in terms of our Christian faith so what I thought we'd do in this last segment is Talk about this one, unconditioned, pure act, pure acting power, this one, absolutely simple, continuous creator of all else that is, this one unrestricted entity, this one truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being itself, this one unconditioned reality, absolutely simple, pure acting power that we have proved. What about that one? How do we reconcile it? Well, with two doctrines in our Christian faith. The first is the doctrine of the Trinity, and the second, the doctrine of the Incarnation. Let's begin with the Trinity for just a second, because, of course, uh, this you know might present some problems to us, but it shouldn't. Because, of course, in our Christian faith, we know... And we say in our creed that there is one God. We believe in one God. And and as you take a look at that one God, we we say also that there's one nature of God or that there is one Godhead. And, And what we mean by that one God is completely compatible with another doctrine. We say there are three persons. There are three persons in the one God. Well, of course, we mean that there's certainly not three gods. We certainly don't mean by any stretch of the imagination that these three persons somehow constitute three infinite entities. I mean, let's go back, you know, to where we started. Let's go back and just say uh, for, for a second, well, yeah, if you have this absolutely simple reality, it has to be one, right? If you have this infinite reality, it has to be one, and we prove that. The key thing then is Christianity is not asserting anything different from that. We're certainly not saying that there is more than one infinite power. That would be a contradiction. We are certainly not saying that there is more than one absolutely simple reality. That would be a contradiction. We are not saying that there is more than one infinity. That would be a contradiction, right? One of them would have to have something, be somewhere, be something that the other one was not. The one that was not somewhere, something, or having that something would be finite by definition because it's not something that the other one is. Therefore, of course, any second infinity is a fake. Any second absolute simplicity, as we saw units ago, is a fake. There's only one, and Christianity has never been prone to arguing contradictions. So if there's only one infinite power, if there is only one infinite nature, if there's only one absolutely simple, unrestricted in every way, no intrinsic, no extrinsic boundaries, 
power, then how can we have three persons? Well, that notion of self-consciousness, as I suggested several units ago, that notion of self-consciousness can really help us out. Because, of course, men, self-consciousness can use that one infinite power. And, of course, you could even have three self-consciousnesses using that one infinite power, and there would be no contradiction in that at all. Let's just review the notion of self-consciousness for a moment. And uh, you, this is coming out in a new book uh, called Emmanuel, but you can also read a, a little bit about it in, in a book by, uh, called Who is Christ by Jean Gallot. But the key idea here is just to, to look at what a self-consciousness is. Why? It's awareness of awareness. And it's even awareness of self-awareness. Now, in God, self-consciousness would be perfect. So it would be a perfectly transparent awareness to self and a perfect, self, a perfect transparent self-awareness to self. And if that is the case, it's a perfect and transparent uh, a person. It's a perfect, transparent self awareness of self-awareness. It is a perfect and transparent, then, ability to not only understand oneself, but understand in relation to everything that is outside the self. Now, Christianity is asserting, because Jesus revealed this, Christianity asserts that there are actually three self-consciousnesses making use, no, making an unconditional use of that one infinite nature, that one infinite power source. Christianity is not saying there's more than one infinity. Christianity is not saying there's more than one nature of God. Christianity is not saying that there is more than one God. Christianity asserts one God, one nature in God, one infinity, one absolute simplicity, one infinite, absolutely simple nature in God, one God. Now, if that's true then what is, say, the Father doing? The Father is making an unconditional use of that one infinite power source. And when the Father makes an unconditional use of that one infinite power source through a completely transparent act of self-awareness and awareness of self-awareness, that means that the Father is able to use right, infinite thought through, as it were, unrestricted thought, perfectly intelligible thought, through a perfectly transparent self-awareness, it is a perfect instance of the use of perfect intelligibility by perfect self-awareness. And the Son is a perfect instance of the use of perfect intelligibility and perfect power through perfect self-awareness. And the Spirit is the perfect instance of the perfect use of perfect intelligibility and perfect, uh, and perfect uh, a power in perfect self-awareness. And so you have then three self-consciousnesses making a perfect and unconditional use of perfect power and perfect intelligibility. Now, no contradiction in that. Next, what are they doing? Well, Jesus tells us they're loving and that's what the Father does. That's why the Father's name is Abba, or Daddy. That's why when the Father reveals who the Son is, right in the cloud, at the baptism, in the transfiguration, what does He call His Son? He says, this is my Son, Ha-Huyas, Ha-Agapetas, the Beloved One. Beloved is the name. And, of course, this name is so powerful. Even John the disciple, who is loved by Jesus, becomes his essence, his name. He calls himself the beloved disciple because that's his essence, just as Jesus' essence is to be beloved by